Just before we get started today, I do want to mention a new channel that I host called Mega Projects. Mega Projects is all about mankind's greatest achievements, where I take a deep look at incredible buildings, projects, structures, and more. Whether it's the world's most impressive skyscrapers, the International Space Station, or Chernobyl's sarcophagus, it's all covered there. New videos come out a couple of times a week on Mega Projects, so if you think it could be for you, please do head over there and subscribe. There is a link in the description below. And let's get into it. When Sir Arthur Conan Doyle first began writing Sherlock Holmes stories back in the late 19th century, 221B Baker Street didn't exist. While Baker Street itself existed and still exists today, the numbers on the street back when Doyle wrote the Sherlock Holmes novels and when Holmes was supposed to reside there, 1881 to 1904, according to Doyle's original stories, the street only went into the hundreds. It would seem that Doyle intentionally picked an address that didn't exist. But this all changed in the 1930s when the street numbers in London were rejigged and reallocated to make things a little more streamlined. During the reallocation, a recently constructed building for the Abbey Road Building Society, aka Santander, known as Abbey House, was awarded all of the odd numbers between 219 and 229. Because the address 221 Baker Street now existed, all of the mail that fans across the world had inexplicably sent to Holmes not knowing that he didn't exist. Really? <laughs> uh, oh, but Doyle did apparently base him on a real person, which we're going to get into in the bonus facts, so you've got that to look forward to. Oh well, the whole thing is now there was a place for this mail to get delivered. It's noted that as soon as the bank began trading from the building on March the 18th, 1932, they were inundated with dozens of letters addressed to Holmes. While most of the letters were basically just fan mail or nice messages wishing the detective well, the bank... <laughs> Who reads a fiction book and assumes it's real? Anyway, the bank were surprised to find that a decent number of people were actually writing to Holmes for help. <laughs> now, you're probably thinking that a large faceless corporation like a bank would have dismissed these letters as an annoyance and have them shredded or something, but that didn't happen. Instead, the bank went out and hired someone to serve as Sherlock Holmes' personal secretary and charged them with reading and responding to the mail. One, that's an absolutely legendary move by the bank. And two, that's an absolutely legendary job. Rather than sending a stock... It's like, what do you do for a living? Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Rather than sending a stock reply on bank stationery explaining that Sherlock Holmes wasn't real, this secretary would write back explaining that Holmes had retired to go live in the country and raise bees on a farm in the South Downs in Sussex. So just perpetuating the lie. <laughs> These poor broken people. <laughs> Fans of Sherlock Holmes may recognize this as being where Arthur Conan Doyle himself claims the detective went in his twilight years in the short stories The Lion's Mane, The Blanche Soldiers, and His Last Bow. Needless to say, Abbey National did their homework when it came to staying and consistent with Holmes' backstory. Well, of course, there's a full-time person figuring this stuff out. According to Nikki Caper, who worked as Holmes' secretary in the 1980s, she also sometimes would write back to fans of Sherlock Holmes using quotes from the aforementioned stories, often telling fans that she, Holmes, had given myself up entirely to that soothing life of nature for which I had so often yearned during the long years spent amid the gloom of London. As it turned out, the bank quite enjoyed the attention of sharing their address with one of London's most famous fictional residents, so much so that they had a small plaque commissioned to sit outside the building, and on their 150th anniversary, they even paid for the creation of a bronze statue that currently sits outside the Baker Street entrance to the Tube. In 1990, though, things turned a little sour when the Sherlock Holmes Museum opened nearby and suddenly decided that they should be the only ones who were allowed to open Sherlock Holmes's fan mail. Although this museum was located between 237 and 241 Baker Street, they argued that, as an authority on Sherlock Holmes, they were better equipped to deal with the correspondence than a billion-dollar company with virtually unlimited resources that had been doing an admirable job at exactly that for about five decades straight. Makes sense. The museum even put a plaque outside their building declaring that the museum was the real home of Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> the courts didn't agree, and they ruled in favor of the bank, since, well, they did technically own 221 Baker Street, and it wasn't their fault that people kept sending letters there to a guy who doesn't exist. The museum fought this decision for over a decade until 2002, when the bank, which was then known as Abbey National, moved its headquarters to nearby Triton Square. 
By this point, Westminster Council had grown pretty sick of dealing with the issue, no surprise there, and when the bank moved, they granted the museum exclusive rights to use the address 221B Baker Street, even though the museum itself, as we said, is situated between 237 and 241 Baker Street. The museum is still there to this day. And now for a bonus fact. While Sherlock Holmes may have been a character Doyle invented, it turns out he didn't create him from scratch, but rather was heavily inspired by one person in particular, with two others contributing to the character's traits as well. First, at the young and impressionable age of 18, Doyle was studying to be a physician at the University of Edinburgh in 1877. It was a professor by the name of Joseph Bell that drew Doyle's attention immediately. Dr. Bell's lectures were bombastic, entertaining, and fascinating. Using his amazing deductive abilities, Dr. Bell would make immediate conclusions about patients that were often spot on. According to Doyle himself, as written in his autobiography, Bell's strong point was diagnosis of not only disease, but of occupation and character. In a famous example, also accounted in Doyle's autobiography, a man stepped forward to Bell without giving any information about himself. After a good eyeing over, Bell gave this conclusion about the man that he'd ever met before. Well, my man, you've served in the army, not long discharged, a Highland regiment, a non-com officer stationed at Barbados. Bell was correct on all points, legitimately just like Sherlock Holmes. He explains how he did it as follows. You see, gentlemen, the man was a respectful man but did not remove his hat. They do not in the army, but he would have learned civilian ways had he been long discharged. He has an air of authority, and he is Scottish. As to Barbados, his complaint, why he was visiting the doctor, is elephantiasis, which is West Indian, not British, and the Scottish regiments are at present in that particular island. Conan Doyle said of such displays of bells, to his audience of Watsons, it all seemed very miraculous until it was explained, and then it became simply enough. During Doyle's second year, Bell singled him out and made him his outpatient clerk, which meant that he took basic notes of the patients who came in and presented them to Bell. Essentially, he became Bell's Watson. Ten years later, when Doyle put pen to paper, this unique and wildly fascinating skill set to take trivialities and turn them into broader, accurate conclusions embodied itself in Sherlock Holmes. And Doyle freely admitted this in an interview later in life, according to the biography Teller of Tales, The Life of Arthur Conan Doyle, Doyle exclaimed, Sherlock Holmes is the literary embodiment, if I may so express it, of my memory of a professor of medicine at Edinburgh University. Further, in a letter to Bell, Doyle told him, it is most certainly you I owe Sherlock Holmes. While there were major elements of Dr. Joseph Bell in Sherlock Holmes, he wasn't the only inspiration. The famed Edinburgh native forensic scientist, public health inspector, and dissector of human bodies, Henry Littlejohn, is also credited for giving Holmes some of his personality. Littlejohn was prominently involved in the investigations of any accident, tragic death, or murder that took place in Edinburgh in that day. Helping pioneer the use of fingerprinting and photographic evidence in criminal investigations, Littlejohn was revolutionizing the way cases were cracked right when Doyle was conceiving Holmes in the 1880s and 1890s. During the time Doyle was writing The Final Problem in 1893, the Ardle murder trial was taking place. Alfred John Monson was accused of shooting his 20-year-old student Cecil Hambra during a hunting trip. The defense claimed that Hambra had accidentally shot himself in the head. According to the Edinburgh News, Little John testified that the position of the wounds, the scorch marks from the bullet, the damage to the victim's skull, and even the smell of the victim indicated the contrary, and that this was murder. Interestingly enough, Dr. Bell was brought in as an expert witness and using his considerable deductive powers, ultimately agreed with Little John. In the end, the jury came back with a verdict of not guilty because it doesn't always work so well in real life, but Doyle used this trial and the forensic science of Henry Little John as inspiration for a part of the character of Sherlock Holmes. And speaking of Dr. Bell being involved in crime cases, by the late 1890s, Dr. Bell had earned quite a reputation as an investigator. So much so, in fact, that when a series of murders of ladies of the night went down, the police called in Bell to help. This became the infamous Jack the Ripper case. You've probably heard of that one. Bell even came up with the name of a man he suspected, but as of the writing for this video, that name has never been released publicly. Dun dun dun! And finally, we have Doyle himself. Bell once wrote a letter to Doyle stating, You are yourself, Sherlock Holmes, and well you know it. To illustrate, in December 1908, Marion Gilchrist was beaten to death during an armed robbery. A Jewish-German immigrant was accused and then convicted of the crime in 1909. He was sentenced to death. 
The following year, Scottish lawyer William Ruffhead wrote The Trial of Oscar Slater, where he laid out the case that Slater was innocent. It's like Netflix documentaries back in the day. In 1912, in hopes of getting Slater a retrial and acquitted, Arthur Conan Doyle wrote his own synopsis, The Case of Oscar Slater, in over a hundred pages, painstakingly highlighting details and circumstances that proved Slater's innocence, not the least of which was that the hammer found in Slater's trunk, thought to be the murder weapon, was an extremely light and fragile instrument and utterly incapable in the eyes of common sense of inflicting those terrific injuries which had shattered the old lady's skull. Of course, something of a chicken and an egg situation, it's not exactly clear if Sherlock Holmes inspired Doyle's own sleuthing or Doyle's detective abilities and passion for the subject helped inspire Holmes. Either way, thanks in part to Doyle, Oscar Slater was acquitted and freed in 1928. As for the name Sherlock Holmes, it is thought to have been taken from two sources. Holmes from the prominent and fellow Dr. Oliver Wendell Holmes, and Sherlock from Doyle's favorite musician, Alfred Sherlock. Probably explains why he's got a weird first name. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, smash that like button below. Do not forget to subscribe. Also, why not check out another channel I do called Highlight History. I'm going to link to that below. Thank you for watching.